Huh? Good evening. Thank you guys for coming. We uh, have a lot of people here. We have four overflow rooms. So thank you for everyone in the overflow room too. Um, on behalf of the Dean's Fellows, my name is uh, Ashley Murphy and I'm the director. I'm Seamus Ronan and I'm the panel chair. And we'd like to welcome you tonight to uh, Reza Azam, ISM, and ISIS. We are honored to have Reza Azam here this evening to discuss what has become a current and pressing issue, both in the United States and across the world, as witnessed by President Obama's visit to a mosque in Baltimore just yesterday. Amidst the re recent terror attacks in the Middle East, Paris, and San Bernardino, California, harmful generalizations regarding the Muslim population's involvement in terrorism have spread rapidly. ISIS's quest for global terror has further exasperated these misconceptions, allowing the continued proliferation of global Islamophobia and xenophobia toward Middle Eastern individuals. This evening, Reza Azan will be addressing the supposed connection between radical Islam and terrorism. We acknowledge for some, the discussion surrounding this issue can be contentious. While we encourage open-minded and honest dialogue in tonight's discussion, we ask that you remain respectful of all views expressed. Please can keep in mind the Notre Dame virtues of discourse, which were passed out to some of you as you entered today. Honesty, knowledge, accountability, generosity, humility, courage, and judgment, if you choose to participate this evening. This discussion would not have been possible without the generosity of our sponsors. We are grateful for the College of Arts and Letters, the Hankel Small Lecture Grants, Learning Beyond the Classroom, the Center for Social Concerns, the Center for the Study of Religion and Society, the Glenn Family Honors Program, the College of Engineering, the First Year of Studies, and we'd also like to thank the Center for Civil and Human Rights, Hesburgh Library, the Classic Department's Kellogg Institute for International Studies, the Nanovic Institute for European Studies, the Notre Dame Institute for Global Development, the Psychology Department, the Political Science Department, the Pompensiazzi Program for Constitutional Studies, the Medieval Institute, the History Department, and the Anthropology Department, and the Poverty Studies Department for their support. And since... <laughs> And since apparently we're thanking everyone on campus, I would also like to thank my parents who are here this evening. <laughs> <laughs> we greatly appreciate the dedication of these departments, institutes, centers, and colleges to the mission of the Dean's Fellows. The role of a liberal arts university is to impart general knowledge, challenge held beliefs, and have students think critically about the opinions they form. We hope this evening will contribute to the mission of this university. Personal thanks to Dean Joseph Stanfield, whose vision and guidance to intellectual engagement led us here tonight. We'd also like to thank Kevin Abbott from the Canab Center, and Chris Henderson and Daniel Latiki from the Mendoza College of Business for making this event possible. They helped with the technology which we'll be using for the Q&A. We will be having mics uh, floating around the audience, which is a little difficult since you guys have some wonderful seats on the stairs. So we will also be having questions submitted online or via text. Uh, we will put up the information uh, once Aslan uh, finishes his opening remarks. Without further ado, let me introduce our moderator tonight, Professor Reynolds. Gabriel Saeed Reynolds is a professor of Islamic Studies and Theology in the Department of Theology here at Notre Dame. He is the author of The Quran in Conversation with the Bible and the Emergence of Islam, as well as the editor of the forthcoming Quran Seminar Scholarly Commentary and New Perspectives on the Quran, the Quran in its historical context, too. He is currently chair of the executive board of the International Quranic Studies Association, while also serving as the director of undergraduate studies here at the Department of Theology. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Reynolds. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you to Seamus and to Ashley and to all the Dean's Fellows for this invitation. It's an honor to share the same stage with them and of course also with Reza Aslam. I'm a professor of Islamic studies and theology here at Notre Dame. And I have just a few introductory remarks, but I won't take long, I promise. In the introduction to the paperback version of his wildly successful book on Islam, No God But God, an introduction written on September 11th, 2005, four years to the day after the attacks on New York and Washington, Reza Aslan makes the case that the rise of jihadi violence is a manifestation of an Islamic reformation. He notes the way in which Muslim leaders consistently 
have issued legal opinions or fatwas to condemn violent attacks perpetrated by jihadis and the way in which jihadis have responded to those condemnations with new violent attacks. I quote, after each of these attacks, a new wave of fatwas was issued, again denouncing the use of violence and terrorism in the name of Islam. And after each fatwa, the jihad is struck again and the war goes on. Today, over 10 years later, this intense cycle of jihadi attacks and Islamic condemnations of those attacks continues. Indeed, in many ways, this cycle has grown only more intense with the rise of the so-called Islamic State or ISIS or Daesh in the Middle East. Last week, a group of international Muslim leaders met in Marrakesh, Morocco, and published a declaration insisting on the responsibility of Muslims to protect non-Muslims living in their societies. And just last week, the jihadist group Boko Haram attacked two Christian villages in northern Nigeria, killing at least 26 people. And so, friends, it seems to be more important than ever that Muslims, Christians, people of faith, and people of no faith have serious conversations about violence, religion, and interreligious harmony, like this conversation tonight. Reza, who knows both Christianity and Islam through scholarly and spiritual journeys, is the author of Zealot and the aforementioned international bestseller, No God But God. He is also the author of How to Win a Cosmic War and a contributing editor to The Daily Beast. His next book, The Story of God, will be published by Random House. And he is also an executive producer of a new ABC television drama of Kings and Prophets, which will begin airing in March. Reza has degrees in religion from Santa Clara University, Harvard Divinity School, the University of California at Santa Barbara, as well as a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Iowa. He is currently Professor of Creative Writing at the University of California, Riverside, with a joint appointment in the Department of Religion. As you know, he appears regularly in the media, including The Daily Show and The Colbert Report. Now, all of this, of course, was one big warm-up act for tonight, his appearance at the University of Notre Dame. <laughs> Friends, please join me in welcoming Reza Aslan. Hello. Thank you all. Hello, Notre Dame. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out here tonight. Thank everybody uh, in the overflow rooms. Thank you to my good friend, Professor Reynolds. Gabriel, are you going to just sit there the whole time staring at me? Because that's awkward and weird. <laughs> Is it? Uh, it's fine. You can. But if I, if I start seeing you making faces, I'm going to have to be upset. Uh, when I walked in here, somebody handed me this Virtues of Discourse, the Notre Dame Pledge. And I just read it backstage. And I've come to the realization that I am an awful, awful human being. I am just, <laughs> I am terrible. Uh, this is amazing. This honestly, it reads, it reads like the exact opposite of like a checklist of qualifications to be on cable news. That's what it. <laughs> I will support the claims I make with good reason or evidence. <laughs> I will always consider the possibility that I might be wrong, <laughs> please. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I actually was around here last year, I think. Was it last year? I feel like it was a year ago. I think I was uh, across the street at St. Mary's. Um, so it is good to be back here. I recognize a few faces out there. Uh, I actually don't remember what I talked about last year. So this might just be a repeat of that conversation. If it is, just keep it to yourself. Um, <clears throat> Some of you know I was uh, born in Iran. I came to the United States uh, after the Iranian Revolution in 1979. Uh, grew up mostly in the Bay Area in the 1980s. Not sure if you remember the 1980s. A lot of you were a little too young there. Uh, it wasn't the best time in the world to be either Iranian or Muslim in the United States, as opposed to now when it's awesome. Uh, everything is great now. Uh, this was, of course, the, the height of the Iran hostage crisis, 444 days in which Americans were being held hostage uh, in the US Embassy 
in Tehran and, you know, for seven year old kid trying his hardest to fit in, it was a very uncomfortable time, as, as you can imagine. In fact, I'm, I'm fairly sure last year at, at St. Mary's, I admitted that I spent a good part of the 1980s pretending to be Mexican, uh, which, yeah, which, by the way, it tells you how little I understood America because it didn't help. Like, it didn't help at all. Like, it's actually not, not useful. Now, I do not recommend that for all you brown people out there. It doesn't help. Um, but it's funny, like now I think back to that time and there was something like sweet and innocent about the anti-Muslim sentiment of the 1980s. Uh, and especially now that we're approaching election season. Ah, oh, election season. Beautiful, wonderful time of xenophobia and race baiting and fear mongering. It's a great, great time in American uh, uh, history. We're now, of course, at this place where once again, uh, Muslims and Middle Easterners, as well as Mexicans and other um, so-called foreigners are once again being demonized, being used for political gain. And what I find most fascinating about this process is how you know, it's like that, that old adage about how if you, you know, put a frog in water and then slowly raise the temperature, the frog won't notice. It's just, that's the, that's how weird and so mainstream anti-Muslim sentiment in the political realm has become that like, it's, it's a slow, gradual progression and we are shocked for a few minutes and then somebody says something far worse and then we don't even remember the previous thing. Remember in 2008, remember the 2008 elections when, uh, you know, President Obama was being called a secret Muslim? It's not that secret, but okay. <laughs> but, and remember, you know, people were like, oh, uh, he's a Muslim. And then people would say, he's not a Muslim, he's a good person. <laughs> And we were all shocked by that. All oh, those days, I miss those days. And then you had the 2012 elections where you had entire campaigns predicated on anti-Muslim sentiment. You had people like Ben Car, uh, not, I'm sorry, Ben Carson, like Herman Cain, uh, uh, you know, promising that if he became president, he would, he would never allow a Muslim in his cabinet. Uh, you had people like Newt Gingrich, uh, promising that his first act upon being president would be to pass a constitutional amendment banning Islamic law uh, in America. By the way, we turns out we already have something like that. It's called the Constitution. So I'm not, if you're gonna, if you want the job of actually, you know, enforcing it, you should probably read it first. Um, <laughs> And that, like, you know, that made the days of 2008, the election of 2012 made the election of 2008, you know, seem, seem like, you know, love and peace and everybody was getting along in Kumbaya. And now here we are in 2016. And man, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I kind of miss Herman Cain. <laughs> I sort of miss the days of, like, of Newt Gingrich. Now we have candidates like Ben Carson essentially saying that, you know, that being Muslim disqualifies you from being president. He did, to his credit, uh, sort of shift what he, what he was saying a little bit and said, well, no, a Muslim can be president of the United States as long as he just stops being a Muslim. So then it's okay. And then you have, of course, Donald <laughs> Trump. Sorry. Sometimes. <laughs> It's an, it's an involuntary reaction. It's an involuntary reaction. It's like acid reflux. I, I vomit in my mouth a little bit when I say his name. It's, don't worry about it. <laughs> Donald Trump, of course, you know, who has made race baiting and xenophobia and, and anti-Muslim sentiment uh, a feature of his presidential campaign. Of course, I do think that it's important to note that while it's easy to see these presidential hopefuls as representing the fringe, the really frightening thing is, is that their thoughts are shared by the mainstream. When Ben Carson said that a Muslim can't be qualified to be president, 57% of Americans agreed with him. 57% of Americans. When Donald Trump uh, called for all Muslims in the U.S. to be registered. He called for a registry of Muslims. And I'm sure that you had the same response that I had when he called for a registry of Muslims, which is, 
No, that, of course that exists, right? We already have that. We have a registry of Muslims. How do we not? I mean, I, I feel like somebody is monitoring me all the time. So I'm surprised that that doesn't already exist. But it turns out 40% of Americans, 40% of Americans agree they want a registry of Muslims. Indeed, nearly one third of Americans, that's more than 100 million of us, one third of Americans think that Muslims should be forced to carry special IDs, identifying themselves as Muslims. And there's a historical analogy there somewhere, but I, I can't put my <laughs> finger on it. So again, we look at these statements, we, it's easy to dismiss them as fringe, but the truth of the matter is that they are actually very much within the mainstream of the American uh, public. So what is this all about? I mean, clearly, we are at this place where the country has been uh, seized by fear. According to Gallup, 49% of Americans, so that's nearly half of us, 49% of Americans uh, are scared of becoming a victim of terrorism. Now, never mind that, you know, 45 Americans in the last 15 years, 45 Americans have been killed uh, by uh, Islamic terrorism. Less, by the way, less, that's fewer Americans that have been killed by right-wing terrorism, by white supremacist terrorism. And by the way, that, that stat that I just gave you doesn't even say the whole story because we, uh, as you may well know, have a fluid definition of terrorism in this country. You know, we, it's, terrorism has become one of those wastebasket words that says a lot more about the person using it than the person being described. So, of course, mass shootings and, and a lot of events that quite clearly read as terrorism. For instance, when the white supremacist Michael Wade Page walked into a Sikh temple and killed seven, I think seven, maybe nine people, I'm sorry, seven or nine people um, in that uh, temple, that was not considered terrorism. When Dylan Roof walked into the Baptist church and opened fire, that's not, according to the FBI, terrorism. And yet, even in those cases that we do label it terrorism, more Americans have died at the hands of white supremacist uh, nationalist groups uh, uh, you know, uh, right-wing groups um, in uh, over the last 15 years than Islamic terrorism. And yet, the overwhelming fear among Americans is of being killed by Muslim terrorists. Never mind, again, also that you are more likely in this country to be shot by a toddler. You are more likely in this country to be shot by a toddler than killed by a terrorist. Let that one sink in for a moment. You are, according to the FBI statistics, more likely to die from faulty furniture than to be killed by a terrorist. That's right. Your lazy boy is more likely to kill you than a terrorist. Look it up. I'm not kidding. So it is an irrational fear. There's no question about that. But that's not the point. In a way, all fear is irrational, and we can't just simply dismiss it by simply calling it irrational, because there is a very real fear that has gripped this country. And that fear, frankly, has a source. And the source of that fear is Islam. More specifically, of course, the threat of uh, Islamic violence, Islamic extremism, but for a great many Americans, there isn't really an attempt to differentiate between Islam as a religion and Islam as an ideology of violence. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is in a moment. Nevertheless, the threat, the threat of religiously inspired violence at the hands of Muslims is a very real threat. It's slight, but it's real. And because of that, we can't dismiss it. We can laugh at it sometimes, but we can't dismiss it. We have to take it seriously. Now, there have been essentially two responses to this very real threat. And you see this kind of polarization that has taken place in the United States when we talk about the threat of Islamic extremism. On the one hand, you have those who say that this has nothing to do with Islam whatsoever. Um, you heard 
the president make comments similar to that um, yesterday, but it's comments that he has made repeatedly. You hear this a lot, of course, from Muslims themselves and, and Muslim leaders that the actions of these uh, fanatics, these extremists, is so beyond the realm of anything that could legitimately be called normative Islam that it just simply is not Islam. It has nothing to do with Islamic ideals or values. I understand that sentiment. I understand the impulse for any community of faith when confronted with radicals and extremists within their community to simply say, that's not us. They don't represent us. They are not us. It's a perfectly reasonable impulse, but it's wrong. It's incorrect. It's incorrect for a very simple reason. And that is that a Muslim is whoever says he or she is a Muslim. The end. And anyone who acts violently in the name of Islam, we have to take that seriously. If a member of ISIS or Daesh is actually saying, I am killing people because my faith tells me to do so, it's not enough to just simply say, no, it doesn't, end of discussion, you're not really a Muslim. Because if they call themselves Muslim, then they're Muslim. If they say they're acting in the name of Islam, let's take that seriously. Because not taking it seriously, rejecting it, keeps us from actually dealing with the problem. Now, I will say, as I'm acknowledging this, that we do have a double standard in this country when it comes to religiously inspired violence. When Anders Breivik in uh, Oslo slaughtered 69 children because he called himself a Christian warrior, a um, crusader uh, fighting against the scourge of Islam, uh, not a lot of people connected those actions with Christianity. In fact, the overwhelming consensus of uh, commentators um, essentially just said, well, that, that has nothing to do with Christianity whatsoever, and this guy's insane, and they began to like, dig through his past to figure out some other reason, some other excuse for that kind of behavior. The same thing happened, of course, with Robert Deere, this man who shot up a Planned Parenthood clinic because he said he was a warrior for Christ. That's what he said. Those were his words. That's why he did it. And yet it was very quickly dismissed in the media that there was something else going on, that it was radicalized by rhetoric or that there was some mental issues happening. When Robert Duggart last year was arrested, this is a Tennessee pastor, uh, a pastor in Tennessee who was arrested by the FBI when it was discovered that he was planning a massacre of Muslims, men, women, and children in the New York town of um, uh, Islamville. Yeah, there's a town in New York called Islamville, let it go. Um, he was arrested, initially charged with terrorism. He had a massive manifesto in which he meticulously explained why it was that Christ had called him to this massacre that he was planning with guns, with machetes. Uh, and yet he's not even in jail today. He was charged with making an over, uh, state, over state, uh, threat given bail, and he's now home watching television. But more importantly, despite the fact that he was a Christian pastor saying that he was doing this in the name of Christianity, very easily we disconnected that from the faith. Why? Well, it's actually not as complicated as it may sound. It, it's not really a double standard. What's truly going on here is that we, because we live in a country that is, according to uh, the Pew, uh, uh, what, what are they called? The Pew Study on Religion and Society? Is that what they're called? Religion and Society? Pew Forum. Pew Forum. Pew Forum on Religion. And, you know, the reason I, I, I saw this, I got to get everything right now. The Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life. The Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life. Um, 
According to them, we are now 73% Christian. 73% of Americans call themselves Christian. Seven out of 10 of us call ourselves Christian. Well, when you live in a country or in any kind of society where you are surrounded by Christianity in all of its diversity, it becomes very easy to dismiss fringe versions of Christianity as not part of the mainstream. It becomes very easy to look at the actions of an Anders Breivik or a Robert Deere or a Robert Duggart and say, well, that bears no resemblance to the normative Christianity that I am familiar with because I am surrounded by Christians. And so therefore it's much easier to simply disconnect that behavior from the religion of Christianity. We are 1% Muslim. The United States is 1% Muslim, 73% Christian, 1% Muslim. Uh, by the way, when we get to 2%, look out. <laughs> taken over. Um, just kidding. Just kidding. Um, I didn't hear a lot of laughter. I was kind of really nervous. It's like, that was just a joke. Okay. So then, when we see acts that represent the fringe of Islam, because we are not familiar with normative Islam, we cannot make the same disconnection as we can with regard to, say, Christianity or even Judaism, for that matter. And by the way, I just want to say, this same thing happens in Muslim-majority states. When you look at a country like Egypt, which I believe is like 89, 90% Muslim, it might be even more than that, um, the reverse happens. It's very easy to dismiss Islamic extremism as not part of normative mainstream Islam, but when confronted with Christian extremism, it's very easy to identify that with mainstream Christianity because there's such a small body of Christians in that country. So we do recognize that there is a serious global problem with religiously inspired violence, and that certainly our focus for a host of very legitimate reasons is on the Islamic variety of that violence. But we can't be fooled into thinking that that is either intrinsic to Islam or that it's somehow unique to Islam, on the contrary. So on the one hand, you have people who say that has nothing to do with Islam, and as we said, that's not very helpful. But the flip side of the argument is also not very helpful. The argument that this is Islam. The argument that there is actually not that much that separates normative Islamic beliefs, behavior, practice from the beliefs and practices of the extremes. That, of course, is a simple answer. It's one that we hear from our political and religious leaders for all the reasons that I said before. It's one that we see a lot in our media. But it's also an incredibly unsophisticated answer. After all, think about it this way. The vast majority of the victims of jihadist violence, I mean, when I say vast majority, I mean by the tens of thousands, the vast majority of victims of ISIS, of Al Qaeda, of Boko Haram are Muslims, other Muslims. And indeed, the people who are on the ground fighting against ISIS, fighting against Al-Qaeda. It's not us. The people who are on the ground fighting against these jihadist groups are also Muslim. So if ISIS is Muslim, and the people they're killing are Muslim, and the people that are fighting ISIS are Muslim, the people who support ISIS are Muslim, and the people who write against ISIS are Muslim, the clerics who write uh, legal uh, judgments in favor of ISIS are Muslim, and the clerics who write fatwas against ISIS are Muslim. Does that say anything, all that sort of generalizing about Islam and violence? It doesn't. What it does, I think, indicate is that there is a much larger, much global conflict th taking place within Islam that we are just witnessing 
uh, sort of little flashes of that, that we are not involved in it. We are not engaged in it. We are in many ways a not so innocent bystanders uh, of this conflict. And so we need to understand where that conflict comes from. We need to understand more importantly that Islamic violence is not happening in a, in a vacuum. It is connected to these ge very fascinating geopolitical trends uh, that have taken place over the last hundred years. And that to, to truly understand the problem of Islamic extremism, we need to look at those trends. We need to look at the problem from a much more global perspective. And in particular, I think we need to look at two really fascinating trends over the last century that have um, created precisely uh, the soil out of which a lot of the violence in the name of Islam that we are witnessing um, has grown out of. The first of these trends is the trend of religious nationalism. Now, within Islam, the concept of religious nationalism is most often referred to as Islamism. Islamism is not a religious ideology, it's a political philosophy. It's a philosophy predicated on the notion that the citizens of a nation state should create their collective identity not based on, say, some measure of ethnic homogeneity uh, or culture or, um, or certainly not based on a kind of civic agreement between uh, free and equal individuals, but instead that that identity should be predicated on religion, and in this case, of course, on Islam, that the very foundation of the state has to be religious, in this case, Islam, that the purpose of nationalism is to, be, is to marry itself with religion to create religious nationalism, that this state should be, in other words, an Islamic state, a state predicated on Islamic values, uh, on Islamic mores, on Islamic traditions, whatever that means. And I say that because there's a thousand different interpretations for that. So Islamism is an Islamic version of religious nationalism. Now I say that because religious nationalism is by no means a uniquely Islamic phenomenon. On the contrary, I think one of the most fascinating trends of the 20th century and even now into the 21st century is the rise of religious nationalism around the world. We see it here in the United States. We have a very large, very dominant, politically potent uh, group of religious nationalists. Scholars sometimes refer to them as Christianists. Uh, oftentimes the term dominionist is used within um, religious circles. But essentially what we are talking about is Christian nationalism. These are Christians who believe that the United States is a distinctly Christian nation, founded on distinctly Christian values and mores and principles, and that our laws, our culture, our customs, the very identity of the state needs to also be predicated on Christianity. Does this sound familiar to any of you? I mean, this is just basically like running for president. I think that's what that's called. As a matter of fact, many of our presidential candidates, our recent presidential candidates are unapologetic Christian nationalists. Take Mike Huckabee, who just you know, uh, quit the uh, GOP race a couple of days ago. If you actually, have you actually heard Mike Huckabee's stump speech? He says in his stump speech that his goal as president is to uh, transform the Constitution so that it is in better alignment with the Bible. Now, that's called Christian nationalism. That's what, that's what that's called. When Rick Santorum says that he wants to outlaw homosexuality and maybe even masturbation, which is kind of a I don't, weird thing to want to outlaw, <laughs> how do you... How do you monitor that? I'm just curious, like, what do you like? What, what kind of police force do you have in your? Anyway, he's he's doing so because he is a Christian nationalist. He's a Christianist. He believes that this country is a Christian nation, 
and it has to abide by Christian ideals, whatever that means. Indeed, by many polls, nearly a third of Congress, both houses of Congress, um, identify themselves as Christian nationalists, and up to 100 million Americans agree with the notion that America is a Christian country, a Christian nation, uniquely so, and that it should be predicated on Christian values and Christian ideals. That's just called religious nationalism. And like Islamism, it comes in both peaceful varieties and violent varieties. That's the thing about religious nationalism is that the ideology can be sort of married to whatever your own personal ideology is. And so Mike Huckabee and Rick Santorum want to turn this into a Christian nation through democratic means. At the same time, however, and now we've become more and more aware of this, we have dozens of Christian militias in the United States, right-wing white supremacist militias in the United States who have the identical goal, but who don't want to reach it in democratic means, want to reach it through revolution and through violence. Of course, when talking about religious nationalism, you have to come up, you have to talk about Israel. In Israel, you have a group of right-wing Messianic Jews. They're often referred to as uh, religious Zionists or Messianic Zionists in order to differentiate them from the secular Zionism that gave birth to the state in the first place. These are groups that you, you may be familiar with, for instance, uh, Gush Emunim, uh, or for instance, the price tag um, uh, uh, thugs that the, the state itself, the government of Israel itself refers to as Jewish terrorists. They, of course, believe that Israel is a distinctly Jewish state. However, their loyalty is not to the state itself, it's to the land. In fact, they believe that the state is nothing more than just a, a placeholder for the land. Their ultimate goal is the recreation of biblical Israel, Eretz Israel. Their ultimate goal is the recreation of the kingdom of David. And they will take part in both democratic, peaceful processes in order to do so. Indeed, a great many of the ruling party in Israel, the Likud party, subscribe to religious messianism, uh, messianic Zionism, I should say, um, including people like Niftali Bennett, who is currently the second most powerful man in the Israeli government. And of course, again, as with Islamism and Christianism, there's a violent form of it. The price tag terrorists are the ones who are actually going around burning down homes, killing men, women, and children because they believe that this land was given to them by God. And as the Bible itself says, no one else, no one else but the chosen people has a right to this land. Of course, it's not just the Abrahamic religions. You see religious nationalism now as a growing phenomenon in a place like India. In fact, if you were just going to talk about numbers, probably just numbers wise, the largest group of religious nationalists in the world are uh, in India themselves. These are adherents to a, a political ideology called Hindutva, uh, Hindu awakening. It's very much the same thing that we've been talking about. These are people who believe that India is a uniquely distinctly Indian state that it was a Hindu state, that it should be predicated on Hindu ideals and mores, uh, that its citizenship should be uh, divided among Hindus and non-Hindus. And again, as with everything else, there is a peaceful strain of it. The BJP is now is, is a, a, a adherent uh, of Hindutva, and that's now the ruling party in India. Uh, the Prime Minister Modi is a member of the BJP and a, a follower of Hindutva ideology, but it also, of course, comes in violent forms, too. You have organizations like the RSS that have been responsible either directly or indirectly for massive amounts of anti-Muslim and anti-Christian violence in the last few decades in India. There's even a Buddhist version of religious nationalism. 
Uh, and that too comes in its peaceful form. You see a country like Bhutan. Bhutan is a country that is predicated on this notion that it's a Buddhist country. It should be predicated on Buddhist notions of value. I mean, Buddhist values and, and Buddhist, Buddhist uh, mores. Uh, and that can be beautiful. And it can actually sometimes even be a little bit strange. Like for instance, uh, not showing compassion in Bhutan is an illegal offense. Like you have to, you are mandated by by law to be compassionate, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> but of course, it comes in a violent form too. And you don't have to look any further than Myanmar to see that. Uh, you can look at this group of uh, really radical, radical Buddhist monks who call themselves the 969 movement. Um, they're led by a man named um, Sayadaw um, uh, Wirathru, Sayadaw Wirathru, uh, who's been called the Buddhist bin Laden. Um, they, of course, believe that Myanmar should not only just be predicated on Buddhist values, but that non-Buddhists don't have a role there. And they have been uh, accused, again, both directly and indirectly, uh, of massacring thousands of men, women, and children of the uh, ethnic Rohingya um, community, the Muslim community there. All of this is to say that religious nationalism is a universal phenomenon. It's something that we are seeing everywhere. And Islamism is nothing more than the Islamic version of this universal phenomenon. And like as in these other cases, it comes in peaceful and violent forms. There are those Islamist groups like the Justice and Development Party, the AK Party um, in Turkey, or the Muslim Brotherhood, who are willing to use democratic means for the goal of creating a state that is predicated on Islamic values and mores. But there are also groups, Islamist groups, that are willing to use violence and revolution. Groups like Hamas or the Taliban, who have the same ultimate goal, the creation of Islamic State, whatever that means, uh, but who aren't willing to do it through peaceful or democratic means, who want violence and revolution to bring it about. So then the question is, is why? Why do we see in all of its varieties, religious nationalism surging around the world. Well, that's a, it's, a, it's a complicated question and it has a complicated answer, but if I were to sort of simplify it, I would have to say that it partly has to do with the failure of secular nationalism. The entire foundation of the 20th century was built on this notion that if we can just if we can just remove religion from our identities, if we can just push our religious identities aside and allow our national identities to subsume that, if we can identify ourselves according to a concept of secular nationalism, then we will finally usher in that era of peace and prosperity um, that is everyone's hope. How'd that go, by the way? How'd that, yeah? Not so great. The 20th century was by far the most violent, the most bestial century in human existence. Tens of millions of people slaughtered in the name of religion? No, in the name of nationalism, in the name of socialism, in the name of communism and Marxism. And so essentially, I think what has happened is that the failure of secular nationalism, the failure of its promises, has, I think, punctured this notion that that is the, the best way to identify yourself as a collective for a great many people around the world. But it's not just the failure of secular nationalism, it's also what accompanied, accompanied it, which is globalization. Globalization, of course, means many things, and this isn't a, a lecture on globalization, but one of the results of globalization is precisely the diminishing of national identities, right? If we're talking about the slow disillusion of the borders and boundaries that separate us as distinct nation states, if we start talking about creating a, a sort of global order, a, a set of alliances that, that cross these boundaries very easily, then 
by definition, what you are talking about is a diminishing of national identities. And as that happens, right, the more national identities begin to diminish, the more, more sort of primal forms of identity, like tribe, like ethnicity, and certainly like religion, rise to the surface to, to make up for it. The more and more people stop identifying themselves first and foremost by their nationality, the more they're going to begin to identify themselves in these more primal forms, especially religion. So it's not that surprising that even in an uber nationalistic place like the United States, we are having more and more people confidently say, I am Christian first and then American. I am Muslim first and then Egyptian. I am Buddhist first and then Burmese. That is becoming a more widespread phenomenon. And that's what I think is leading to precisely the kind of religious nationalism in all of its varieties, but especially within Islam that we're seeing. Why do I say especially within Islam? Because one thing that's fairly unique about particularly the, the Muslim populations of the Middle East is that this is a part of the world in which the very concept of nationalism uh, is a very late phenomenon. This is an idea that was uh, brought to this region by outsiders, by colonialists. You were talking about populations that are living in these sort of fabricated nation states with these almost arbitrary borders, many times drawn for the sole purpose of being able to divvy it out among, you know, European colonialists, the winners of the Second World War, etc. And so as a result, the First World War, excuse me. Um, and so as a result, the concept of a national identity was always a foreign idea anyway. And so it, I think, shouldn't be surprising that in this part of the world in which nationalism and the idea of the nation state was such a late phenomenon, that that's the part of the world in which it is being most, I think, vigorously challenged by religion as an alternative form of identity. But nevertheless, as strong a force as Islamism is, we have to remember two things. It's not unique to Islam. Religious nationalism is on the rise everywhere. And like all religious nationalism, there's a violent version and a nonviolent version. And we have to figure out whether we want to, um, and this is a conversation that we're definitely going to have at the end of this uh, lecture, whether what we really want to do is suppress all forms of religious nationalism, all forms of Islamic nationalism, violent or peaceful, or whether we think that the peaceful form of Islamism can be a kind of remedy for the violent form of Islamism that we see in places like Nigeria or in Afghanistan uh, or in Iraq and so on. Now, that's one strain, right? Religious nationalism is one strain. And again, the Islamic version of that is called Islamism. But there is a whole other strain that has arisen, a whole other trend that has arisen over the last few decades that I think is equally interesting. And that's what we've been calling jihadism. You've heard me use this term already. Now this might be a little bit confusing because Islamism and jihadism are often sort of intertwined. People tend to use those terms uh, you know, interchangeably, um, but they mean very different things. Islamism, as I said, is a theory of religious nationalism, right? An Islamist group like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt doesn't really care about anything that happens outside of Egypt. Their goals, their aspirations, their ideology, their agenda is more or less contained within the boundaries of Egypt. They want to create a nation. They are nationalist, but a religious variety of it. Jihadists are not just transnationalists, but in a way, they're also anti-nationalists. 
far from wanting to create an Islamic state, they want to rid the world of all states, Islamic or otherwise. They want to get rid of all borders, all boundaries. They want to rid us of all national identities. Their goal is not to create a state. Their goal is to reconstitute the globe as a single world order under their control. And of course, the shorthand for that ideology is the caliphate. When they use this term caliphate, that's what they are talking about. A new kind of world order that's not based on your ethnicity or your nationality or any kind of, you know, fabricated borders, but based solely on a division between belief and unbelief. Now, in the same way, of course, that Islamism comes in violent and peaceful varieties, so does jihadism. Jihadism is actually quite a widespread phenomenon. But there are many jihadists, they're sometimes referred to as uh, Salafists, or you know, there's all kinds of other names that we have for them, who want the recreation of a caliphate, who long for a world that is reconstituted based on belief and unbelief, who want all those things, but who have no interest in bringing that about through violence, who want to do that primarily through dawah, through, through preaching, through transformation. And then, of course, there are those who have the exact same goals, but who want to achieve it through revolution and violence. And here, finally, we get to uh, a group like ISIS or Daesh. This is an organization that is fairly new, but its roots are very much based in this jihadist ideology, which I think most scholars would trace to perhaps, you know, the late 80s or early 90s. Really, it's the war in Afghanistan that, that becomes the, 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 the kind of touchstone for the, the formation of what we now sort of confidently can refer to as the ideology of jihadism. I think the thing that's most surprising about jihadist groups uh, like Al-Qaeda, like ISIS, is the kind of people who are drawn to it. This is baffling to a lot of outsiders. And in fact, it's a source of a, a great deal of media conversation, you know, but I don't understand. He was perfectly assimilated and he had a college degree and he had a job. He wasn't poor. He wasn't suffering. It wasn't, a, you know, it wasn't a source of deprivation for him. Why would he go and join ISIS? But again, that sort of confusion comes from a lack of understanding of what exactly jihadism is as an ideology. I mean, I want you to think about this for a moment. If you are gravitating towards an ideology, the purpose of which is to create a utopian ideal, a brand new world order, a reconstituted global order, right? One without borders and boundaries, one without nationalities and ethnicities. What kind of person do you think gets drawn to that kind of idea? An educated person, a fairly well-off person, someone for whom that utopian, frankly, imaginary ideal actually has some appeal. Usually the kind of people who are drawn to Islamist organizations are people who are coming at it from a place of deprivation. If you are a Palestinian living in a garbage heap that used to be your home before the Israeli government bulldozed it, that's what you care about. You join Hamas, you don't join Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda can't do anything for you. Al-Qaeda's answer is, let's create a new world order. Hamas's answer is, let's kill some Israelis and you'll get your house back. That's what appeals to me. Islamists are far more drawn by local grievances, localized concerns, national ambitions. Jihadists tend to be drawn to these, again, the opposite, these global, utopian, idealistic um, agendas. And so the people who are drawn to jihadist movements tend to be more sophisticated, better educated, 
uh, not necessarily impoverished, much more middle class. And indeed, that's precisely what we're seeing when we're looking at the kind of people who join an organization like ISIS. Again, it shouldn't come as that much of a surprise that we have had now thousands of Europeans leave Europe for Syria, for Iraq to join ISIS. It's a you know, terrible situation and it's one that Europe is desperately trying to do something about, but it shouldn't come as a surprise to us. I mean, I want you to think about this for a moment. The world that ISIS envisions, this world without borders and boundaries, this world without nationalities, this world uh, that is sort of a reconstituted whole. Does that world sound familiar to anyone? Because it sounds to me like the European Union. That's what it sounds like. 27 nationalities, one birth certificate, one currency, one sort of uber government in Brussels. No borders, fluid boundaries, right? These are people who have grown up in a world that looks a lot like the kind of world that ISIS is envisioning, minus the beheadings, but nevertheless. So they are, in a sense, primed to this notion. At the same time, of course, they are, as many of us know, dealing with a massive identity crisis within Europe. They are the, the sons and daughters, the grandsons and granddaughters of a generation of migrants who came to Europe after the Second World War, essentially as guest workers, people to come to clean up the devastation of that conflict without giving, ever being given an opportunity to actually assimilate into wider European culture, oftentimes forced into these ethnically segregated neighborhoods, burdened with these citizenship laws that honestly I think to a lot of Americans are just mind-blowing. I mean the heart of the American ideal is that you could, you know, your mother could have been in this country for 30 seconds. If you were born here, you're as American as George Washington. That's just, that's the foundation of our beliefs. It may not be what Ted Cruz believes, but the rest of us <laughs> believe that. And so in a sense, if you can imagine a country like, say, Germany, which until very, very recently had the most restrictive citizenship laws, whereby if your father, if you were born in Germany, and your father was born in Germany, but your grandfather was born in Turkey, you're not automatically a German citizen. You are considered a Turk. And so that sense of an identity crisis, which by the way is being shared across Europe, regardless of what color you are, or what religion you are, has created, I think, a population, a generation that is desperate for the kind of ready-made identity that a group like ISIS provides, this ideology, right? It's a very simple argument. Do you know why you don't feel either Pakistani or British? Do you know why you don't feel either Turkish or German? It's because you're not these things. They don't exist. Nationality is an illusion. It's your imagination. There's no such thing as German or British or Pakistani. There is only belief and unbelief. Which side are you on? That is an enormously appealing message. Now, it's an enormously appealing message, but it is one that comes very clearly with religious ideology attached to it. And so we get back to these two arguments, right? The two sides. It has nothing to do with Islam. It has everything to do with Islam. And this notion that neither of those views are satisfactory, that they are both, I think, misunderstanding the enormous complexity of this issue that we've touched upon just barely in the last 30 minutes. And I think the issue here is fundamentally a misunderstanding of what we mean when we say religion, what we mean when we say religious. And because we don't understand that term, we don't understand what religion truly is, what it truly signifies, then we get caught in this polarization. It has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do with religion. 
Religion, it's important to recognize, is not just a matter of beliefs and practices. Yes, of course, beliefs and practices are important, but that's not what religion is about. Religion is above all else a matter of identity. It's about who you are, how you define yourself in an indeterminate world. In fact, the phrase, I am a Muslim, I am a Christian, I am a Jew, is far less a faith statement than it is an identity statement. I just told you that Pew says 73% of Americans are Christian. I want you to think about that for a minute. 73%? Really? 7 out of 10 of us are Christian? 7 out of 10 of us go to church on a regular basis? 7 out of 10 of us read the Gospels? 7 out of 10 of us can tell you anything about Jesus except that he was born in a manger and died on a cross? No, of course not. The fact of the matter is that the majority of that 70%, when asked an answer, I am Christian, are not so much making a faith statement as they are making an identity statement. A statement that in many ways encompasses all the other markers of their identity, especially their nationality. In fact, I would venture to guess that a great many of those people, a great many of those Americans, when they say, I am a Christian, mean I'm American. That's what they mean. For them, the cross and the flag has essentially melded into a single icon. But nevertheless, that identity statement, I am Christian, I am Jewish, I am Buddhist, I am Muslim, necessarily encompasses all the other aspects of your identity, all the other markers of your identity, not just your nationality, but your ethnicity, your gender, your sexual orientation, how you define yourself. And so if that's what religion is, then this argument about whether religious violence is religious or not completely falls apart. It's not that it's not religious, it's political. It's that there's no difference between religion and politics, that they are very much the same thing. It's not that they're not fighting for religious reasons, they're fighting for nationalist reasons, because there's no difference between religion and nationality, that they are very much tied together. So, if we're going to do something about Islamic violence, or for that matter, religious violence in general, we have to stop pretending that religion is something unique or unusual, that it's separate from the other things that make us who we are. So, what do we do about it? Well, number one, let's recognize that there is a religious component to this, as we've talked about. That it's not enough to just simply say that this is only for political reasons, they are just there doing this for political reasons. We know that religion and politics are pretty much the same for a great many people. So let's assume that when they speak in religious terms, they mean what they say. And let's confront it. How do we confront it? Well, that of course begins with a robust counter argument, a counter narrative from religious communities themselves. Part of why I was saying that it's not helpful for religious communities to pretend that violence or extremists within them are not them is that it makes it impossible to deal with extremism. We have to recognize that there is a problem within our religious communities, a problem of radicalism. And particularly within Islam today, there is a massive problem, a cancer within the Islamic community. And so we need a counter argument, Matt. We need a counter narrative to that. And that counter narrative has to come from within the Muslim community itself. And as Professor Reynolds clearly said, that has been going on for a very long time. In fact, that argument is part of what I've referred to as the Islamic Reformation. So number one, we need a religious answer, a, a counter argument from the communities themselves. Number two, we have to recognize that, of course, politics has a role in this because politics, like religion, is a matter of identity. And so there has to be some room for political Islam. There has to be room made for 
Islamism in its peaceful form. Because if we do not allow for a space for people who espouse a certain kind of religious nationalism to express those views in a free and fair society to a elected uh, to to a a, a, a a populace that can elect them into office if that population agrees with them if we continue to suppress uh, political Islam or political Christianity or political Buddhism if we suppress it then we radicalize it when someone like Mike Huckabee says he wants to change the constitution so that it's in alignment with the Bible. We don't say, oh, guess what? That disqualifies you from running for president and now we're gonna throw you in prison. We don't say that. We actually allow him to almost be the Republican nominee for president as he was in 2008, almost. We allow those ideas to be part of the marketplace of ideas and then we allow in a free and fair society populations to decide whether they agree with those ideas or not, even though those ideas may be grotesque to some of you. That's just how it works. However, if you are a politician in Egypt and you stand up today and you say you would like to change the constitution of Egypt so that it is in better alignment with the Quran, you will never be heard from again. You will be thrown into prison and you will be tortured and very likely executed. Just simply being a member of the Muslim Brotherhood right now is enough to get you killed. When you suppress, especially violently, when you violently suppress legitimate expressions of religious nationalism, you radicalize it. When you give it an opportunity to express itself in a free and open society, more often what happens is that it moderates that behavior. There are countless examples of this. And then finally, if religion is a matter of identity, then we have to understand that constant attacks on that identity in the form of anti-Muslim rhetoric, particularly when it's coming from political and religious leaders, is doing nothing but causing a greater problem. If you have someone who is desperately trying to make sense of who they are and they are constantly being told that who they are is the enemy, is demonic, is someone worthy of not just suppression, uh, but someone that needs to be labeled so everyone else can see them coming from a mile away, that notion is going to continue to create uh, and that identity crisis that feeds these transnational movements like ISIS and Al Qaeda. When Secretary Clinton said Donald Trump is, you know, essentially the greatest propaganda for ISIS, she was absolutely right, as we discovered a few weeks later when ISIS started running commercials about Donald Trump, essentially saying to American Muslims, we told you, we told you so. We told you it was just a matter of time, and here you go. Join us, because the American identity is a figment of your imagination. So if the issue now is the religious counterargument, room for political debate, and a sort of careful notion of what it means to actually foster identities, firm national identity, not just in the US, but in Europe as well. What that essentially indicates is that every one of us has a role to play in this conflict. Because these are not just issues for our political leaders to discuss. It's up to you. It's up to you to foster greater in engagement with people of different religions or different races or different colors. It's up to you to robustly reject the kind of xenophobic and race baiting rhetoric that we are hearing over and over again, to reject it with your voice and to reject it with your vote. It's up to you to actually allow for these legitimate political expressions of religiosity to have a place. And then it's up to you to decide whether you accept those views or not. Every single person in this room has a responsibility 
Because after all, if we go back to where we began, which is this overwhelming but irrational fear of an other that has gripped this country, we have to recognize that if we don't want to live in that kind of country, then we are the only ones who can actually do anything about it. We are the only ones who can fix that problem, not just in the United States, but in the rest of the world. Thank you very much. So we will be taking questions from the audience along with online submissions. Professor Reynolds will be moderating the Q&A, um, substituting between questions from the audience and those that are being submitted online. So friends, we're going to alternate. As Seamus mentioned, um, I have questions from you coming in quickly. And uh, there'll be people presumably around with uh, microphones. So I'll just go back and forth. Um, we have about 20 minutes for questions. OK, so here we go. Reza, should Muslims obey the word of God, how can Muslims preach peace when the Quran teaches jihad? Well, I mean, the Quran teaches a lot of things. I mean, this is, a, this is, I think, what's remarkable about scriptures is that these scriptures exist and continue to exist for thousands of years. And not because they are true, but because they are infinitely malleable. Because they can address every situation that a community of faith can find themselves in. Listen, the history of religions is littered with dead scriptures. Scriptures that did not have the ability to be constantly evolving, did not answer the uh, enough questions so that they can be reconciled with the realities of the modern world. We read these scriptures precisely for that reason. So it shouldn't come as a shock when we discover that the same Hebrew Bible, the same Torah that says, you should turn the other cheek. Uh, I'm sorry, the same that, that says that, uh, you know, you should, uh, uh, I've, I've lost all my, my Hebrew here. Um, the same Torah that says, um, you know, treat others the way that you would have them do unto others as you would have them do unto you is also the same Torah that says that every non-worshipper of Yahweh, every man, woman, and child, everything that breathes should be put to death. The same gospel. The same gospel that says, turn the other cheek. The same Jesus who says, you know, give your cloak to whoever doesn't have one, also said that I've not come to bring peace, but the sword, and that he who does not have a, a sword should sell his cloak and go buy one. The same Quran, the same Quran that says that if you kill one individual, it is as though you have killed all of humanity, also says, that you should slay the idolater wherever you find him. So which one? Which one do we follow? Which version of the Torah should we follow? The one that the price tag terrorists in Israel follow or the one that your local rabbi uh, in South Bend follows? Which Jesus should we follow? The one who calls for selling your cloak and buying a sword or the one who says to give your cloak away to whomever doesn't have one? Which Quran should we follow? The one that unambiguously denounces uh, the killing of innocents or the one that says you should slay them where you find them? Now, for non-religious people, the answer is easy. Well, it's all bunk. That's the problem. You know, don't listen to any of it. But for those who are religious, you have to recognize that the relationship that an individual has to his or her scripture is precisely that, a relationship. It's a dialectic. That it is, we have this sort of tendency to think that religious people derive their values from their scriptures, but it's far more often the case that religious people insert their values 
into their scriptures. Otherwise, every Christian, all two billion Christians would read the Bible in exactly the same way. And you certainly know that that's not the case, right? All one and a half billion Muslims would read the Quran in exactly the same way. That's obviously not the case. We bring ourselves, our ideals, our preconceived notions, our misconceptions, our aspirations into our scriptures. Not 200 years ago, both slave owners and abolitionists not only used the same Bible to justify their viewpoints, they used the exact same verses to justify their viewpoints. That's the power of scripture. It is what you want it to be. So I think that the, this, this question of how do we reconcile it, that's an individual's question. If you're somebody in this room and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, well, you know, the Quran tells me that I should go and slay idolaters, so I'm going to go do that. And then you're just going to ignore the other parts of the Quran that tell you not to kill people. Then you're an ideologue. The flip side of that is that if you're a Muslim sitting in there and you're saying to yourself, the Quran tells me not to kill anyone, and you're just going to completely ignore the violent parts of the Quran, then you're an ideologue. I think you should all recognize, especially the religious people in this room, you should all recognize that as holy and as divine as you think your scripture is, it is purely subjective that it's about you and the text. And without you, it's just words on a page. Thank you. We have a question from the audience. Who are people with the microphones? So you can just be recognized by raising your hand and somehow we'll pass a microphone to you. Well, yeah, <clears throat> please, sir. Thank you. I, I'm impressed by your last paragraph and the challenge that you've given us. But I wonder whether it's not possible to integrate into your analysis the long, hard struggle for, 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 for modern democracy at its best, for a debate about the common good. And within the common good is the acceptance of religious diversity. So that the great challenge is that our religious leaders and we ourselves as individuals, as you said, have to develop a tolerance for a variety of religious beliefs. And perhaps with the idea that we don't all, at any time, any of us on this planet, fully understand the deity. <laughs> and that there therefore should be a great respect for the variety of faiths who are struggling to do that and to serve the common good. I, I wonder if you'd yeah. com comment no, on that. I mean, clearly someone here has read the Notre Dame Pledge. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a really wonderful point, and I, and I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I often say that the foundation of democracy is not secularism. The foundation of democracy is pluralism. The foundation of democracy is the ability of people of different ethnicities, of different creeds, to be able to live under, as equal citizens, under the same exact law, that that law applies to all of them as the same. Now, that's something that we strive for here in the United States. We don't always do a very good job of it. There are currently 23 states, 23 states now that have passed laws banning Sharia, banning Islamic law. Now, every one of those are going to eventually be overturned um, by the Supreme Court because every one of them are unconstitutional. The first one that was passed was in Oklahoma. That one has already been overturned and the rest of them will also fall. So in that fact that I just gave you is both the sort of the promise and the peril of what it means to be American, right? That we are at once a nation that is totally comfortable denying one religious community the same rights and privileges that every other religious community has, that as a population we will gladly vote to make that happen, but that at the same time we have this sort of safety net, right, the Constitution, that overrides the prejudice, uh, the bigotry of the population. It sometimes takes a little while, but at least it's there. 
Um, and so I do think that we, we provide a model. We provide a very good model for how a true commitment to religious diversity, to religious pluralism, and indeed even ethnic diversity and pluralism uh, can sustain uh, a modern nation state. I mean, I remind you all that demographers tell us that we are now about a decade away from becoming the first nation in history to be majority minorities. That's astounding. It also scares the crap out of a lot of people. Um, but it's just a fact. Um, and so I think a lot of the conflicts that we are seeing now, a lot of the, the fear mongering, you hear this all the time. I'm angry. I am angry. That's why I'm, you know, I love Trump because he tells it like it is because I'm so angry. Well, a lot of that anger comes from precisely this fear that I'm talking about. Um, you know, diversity, multiculturalism, these things can be fearful, but I, I think that, that we are at the very least proof that it need not be so. Great, thank you. There are a number of intense questions coming through here. Um, so it's hard to choose from them, but among them is, um, Press Aslan, you, you mentioned that the definition of terrorism is fluid, so help us out here. What's your definition of terrorism? Okay. This is my definition. It has nothing to do with you or the dictionary or anything else. My definition of terrorism is any individual, organization, or state that haphazardly targets a non-combatant population for a political purpose. That's my definition of terrorism. Now, let me just say, well, you might not clap anymore, because by that definition, we are responsible, we are accused, the United States is accused of terrorism. By that definition, the state of Israel is accused by terrorism. So is Hamas and Hezbollah. You know, if you target civilian populations haphazardly for political purpose, you're a terrorist. It's as simple as that. Now, if Dylan Roof, a white supremacist, walks into a black church and executes a government official and other worshipers, he's a terrorist. That's not just a random act of violence. That is an ideology that has created an act of violence for a political purpose. And yet, the FBI refuses to call it terrorism. And so, I mean, when Robert Stack, you guys don't remember this guy, this is a guy who three years ago flew his little airplane into an IRS building in Oklahoma, I think, an IRS building in Oklahoma, killing an IRS official, government official, left behind a gigantic manifesto, essentially saying that the gov government overreach has made it to the point where the only legitimate response to the United States government is violence. Killed himself in the process too. Under what definition can that not be considered terrorism? A white supremacist anti-government radical leaves a document behind explaining that violence is the only response to the US government then flies a plane into a government building killing a government official. Under what definition is that not terrorism? The FBI has not called it terrorism, will not call it terrorism. Um, and so that's what I mean when I say it's just, it's just a useless word now. It, 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 it means nothing anymore. Thank you. Do we have a question from the audience? If the Quran is just words on a page, are you discounting the inspiration of Allah? And then how do you recognize, reconcile this with the foundational Islamic beliefs of the inspiration of the word of God? In fact, the Quran says that discrediting the Quran itself is blasphemy. I think that the Quran is divinely inspired. I think that the Bible is divinely inspired. I think Abbey Road is divinely inspired. <laughs> My concept of God refuses to acknowledge this idea that he communicates himself only once and only at a particular time and only in a particular language. 
my concept of God is one that cannot abide by anything but a constant communication with human beings. But a divinely inspired text is still a text that was written in a particular time, in a particular place, to a particular audience. And I think that denying the historical context in any scripture in the world, not only do I think that that's irrational, because historical context is a fact, but I actually think that it takes away from a far deeper, more meaningful reading of scripture um, than one that rejects context. I mean, we were having this conversation at dinner uh, earlier. We were talking about how r recognizing that Jesus is talking to a very specific audience about very specific social ills in a very specific time and place actually allows for, I think, a much more fruitful understanding of his mission in his ministry than pretending that his words and his actions have no context whatsoever. Recognizing that the Apostle Paul was writing a letter not to us, but to someone very specific allows us for allows for a much better understanding of what it is that Paul is trying to say. Recognizing that the revelation of the Quran was revealed to a specific community dealing with very specific issues in a specific time doesn't take away the extraordinary quality or indeed the divine quality of the Quran. On the contrary, I think that it opens it up to a far greater understanding. Don't believe me? Take a class with Professor Reynolds. <laughs> Did I get you in trouble? <laughs> this talk just keeps getting better. <laughs> so Professor Aslan, uh, many American progressives are nervous about questions of gender equality in LGBT rights and Islamic societies. How would you respond to them? I mean, I wrote, some of you know, I wrote an entire um, essay about this, a letter to uh, American Muslims um, not too long ago with my co-writer co Hassan Minaj um, making a, a passionate argument about why American Muslims, especially American Muslims, should support LGBT equality um, in the wake of the Supreme Court decision. It might be interesting for you to know that 40% of American Muslims uh, support same-sex marriage. 40%. That's a huge number among religious communities. Um, again, I think it all has to do with your own views. If you are someone who accepts uh, LGBT individuals and communities as uh, legitimate and and uh, you know uh, equal to to everyone else, then that's how you're going to read your scripture. Your scripture is not going to make you bigoted against you know gays and lesbians. You either are or you aren't. I have dozens of gay Catholic friends and Jewish friends and Muslim friends, all of whom are quite devout in their religion and have no problem reconciling their faith with their sexual orientation. Other people may have a problem with that reconciliation, but it's none of their business. They don't get to say anything about it. They don't get to have an opinion about it as far as these individuals go. I think that truly, anti sort of anti LGBT sentiment is is something that I think is dominant in in a lot of religious traditions. Um, you can find, you know, these kinds of uh, statements in the New Testament, you can find them in the Hebrew Bible, you can find them in the Quran. And for the most part, this goes back to what I was saying before about recognizing that there is, as divine a text as it may be, that there is a historical context to these texts and to be able to actually 
reconcile your beliefs with the way in which those, that context necessarily changes as society changes, as our as information changes. So for me, I don't have a problem whatsoever. And by the way, I should mention one thing too. I think like all bigotries, like all bigotries, whether it's Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, whatever it is, homophobia is not about uh, ignorance, it's about fear, right? And fear is impervious to data. So it's it doesn't really do any good to sort of confront someone who is bigoted against someone because of either their race or the color of their skin or their ethnicity or religion or their sexual orientation. It doesn't really do much good to, con to confront them with information. You can give them all the information you want to. You can teach them all about biology and genetics and it won't matter. The only thing that really changes people's minds is relationships. Knowing someone of another gender or orient, sexual orientation or race or religion, that's how minds are changed. My view of the LGBT community was when I was younger, stunted by the fact that I didn't really know anybody. I didn't know any gays or lesbians. I just didn't. And so my religious view of them was very conservative. And then I got to know gays and lesbians. Some of them are very, very close friends, dear friends that I love dearly and passionately. And so when confronted with that same scripture, it is impossible for me to to do anything except to sort of reroute that information through my own experience. And I think that's what everybody does. I don't think I'm unique in that way. Thank you. Question from the audience. <clears throat> um, thanks for coming, by the way. Um, you, you kind of invited us to like answer the question, like how do we decide what the worldview to follow? Yeah. I, I just want to kind of throw that back. Like how did you decide? Because if I remember correctly, uh, you did the whole like youth group thing kind of growing up and um, then there was a switch, I guess, that happened. And I'm wondering like, was it a Christian doctrinal belief or was it, what was the straw that broke the camel's back? Um, discrepancies, maybe in the New Testament, I don't know. Are you asking for my testimony? Kind of, wait, hang on, no, no. no but also on the flip side, um, what, what did you find gripping or compelling in Islam then? Right. Well, so look, I mean, I, I grew up in essentially like a, you know, culturally Muslim family. You know, we were Muslim in the way that most people are religious. It was just kind of part of our identity. You know, we would uh, occasionally go to mosques, certainly for holidays and things like that. It was just kind of, you know, who we were. But I don't remember ever having any kind of religious instruction at all. I had, of course, this very traumatic experience when I was a kid, which was I lived through the Iranian Revolution, which I think seared itself in my in my consciousness. It, it, it made me realize the power that religion has to transform societies for good and for bad. And that has never left me. In fact, it created this abiding interest in religion and spirituality that, by the way, nobody else in my family shared. Uh, my dad was like a radical, like anti, you know, religious, uh, you know, Marxist. Um, and my mom was just like, you know, sort of culturally religious. And so I grew up r really fascinated by religion and mythology and these kinds of stories, and but without really any opportunity to um, express that in any meaningful way. Um, when I was in high school, as you as you rightly brought up, I went to um, an evangelical youth camp and I heard the gospel story for the first time, this incredible story about the God of heaven and earth coming down in the form of a baby, of, of dying for our sins, this promise that anyone who believes in him um, will also you know, never die but have eternal life. 
I'd never heard anything like that before in my life. It was a transformative experience for me. And I immediately converted to this particularly conservative brand of evangelical Christianity. Uh, and then I began preaching that gospel uh, to everyone, whether they wanted to hear it or not, frankly. Uh, I, I was a Bible thumper. I think that's the, the pro proper, proper term for it. When I went to college, uh, I went to a Jesuit university, Santa Clara University. Yay, Jesuits! Uh, come on, let's hear it for the Jesuits! Uh, they're here, let's hear it for the Jesuits! Um, love the Jesuits. Uh, they, uh, I started taking courses in religion, courses in the New Testament. And I was confronted with a different Jesus. Um, the, what I like to call the Jesus of history, as opposed to the Christ of faith that I was taught about in church. And I guess the only way that I can put it is that the Jesus of history became more interesting to me. This poor, marginalized, uneducated, very likely illiterate peasant from the backwoods of Galilee, who through his charisma through the power of his teachings, created a movement on behalf of the poor and the weak and the dispossessed, a movement that was seen as such a threat to the greatest empire the world had ever known that he was hunted down like a criminal, arrested, tortured, and executed for sedition. That guy seemed way more interesting to me than the kind of celestial spirit with no concern for the cares of this world that I had been taught. And so not only did that change me academically, that made me realize, man, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to study religious history. This is what I want to do. But it also changed me spiritually because it made me realize that religion is ultimately little more than a language of symbols and metaphors that allow an individual or a community of faith to communicate with each other the ineffable experience of faith, right? It's a language, that's what it is. It provides a way for us to talk about what is impossible to talk about, to express what is totally inexpressible. I mean, if you're talking about God, you're talking about something that is so beyond the realm of the human experience that how are we supposed to even talk about it? Well, here's a language to talk about it. And so when I realized that, I started looking for different languages. I started learning different languages, the same way that you learn German or French or Arabic or whatever. I started learning different ways of expressing um, my spirituality. And what I discovered, truly to my surprise, was that the symbols and metaphors of Islam, the language that Islam provided, uh, sort of were more comfortable to me. They, they, they made more sense to me. It's not like they were more right. They are not more right. It's not like it was more correct. It's not more correct. Uh, but the symbols, the metaphors, that Islam uses to describe God and humanity and the relationship between the two um, were more appealing to me. And so that's, that's you know, the, the, the switch that I made. Wow, that was a walk through my spiritual <laughs> life. <laughs> Friends, I think this is going to be the last question. So if you've got an appointment or somewhere to go, um, maybe you can hang out with us just a couple more minutes. I'm going to I'll be giving, I promise. I'm going to skip the question, uh, which someone asked if Colbert or John Stewart is, um, wh which one is more funny? I'm going to skip oh, right by that. Colbert, with definitely Colbert, yeah. I mean, John, John is hilarious, but Colbert is. So, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Aslan, um, you strongly identify um, yourselves in some ways um, with um, with Islam, but you're you also, based on what you've been telling us tonight, um, seem to be a pluralist. 
Does this particular position ever lead you to feel threatened either by Christian extremists or by Muslim extremists? I'm, I'm in this great place where everybody hates me. So I get it from all over the place, you know? Um, I get, I have an entire, it's, it's, I mean, I guess it's kind of funny, but not all that funny, but I have this entire file folder that's just marked death threats. And, uh, and, uh, and I get it. Like I've gotten it from Muslims and from Christians, honestly, to be perfectly frank, the group that I get it from the most and the loudest and really the most sort of despicable versions of it uh, is neither Christians nor Muslims, but like these radical atheists, these new atheists who have become a religion of their own, weirdly. Um, they're the ones that I get it the worst from. But uh, I once, funny story, I once, um, a friend uh, and uh, and we were like, you know, talking to each other and he, and I discovered that he, he worked for the FBI. And I was like, hey, listen, um, I got a question for you. I got this entire file folder of death threats. Um, you know, what, what should I, like, can I give it to you? And can you like do something about it? And he said, no, no, don't worry about it. And I was like, why? And he's like, listen, if someone tells you they're gonna kill you, they're not gonna kill you. <laughs> you have to worry about the guy who doesn't tell you. did not make me feel any better at all. So with many, with many apologies, I'm sorry, sir, we can't take any more questions. And that, <laughs> <laughs> so apologies um, to all of those, <laughs> all of these questions we couldn't get to either um, with someone raising their hand or the questions submitted. Um, I think we should hold our applause because we may hear, is that right, from Ashley or Seamus who's gonna give us some concluding remarks. Well, thanks everyone for coming. This was a really great event. Thanks to Dr. Oslin, thanks to Dr. Reynolds. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. So if you're interested in continuing this dialogue, we are working with the CSC to kind of create a campus-wide dialogue. So please feel free to sign up on these um, sign-up sheets right here and we will contact you for further events. Thank you. Thank you.